Hello and welcome back to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered. I'm John Duca with the Drone Launch Academy here to find the answers to your drone questions, the ones that you submit. Today's question is a really good one. It's submitted by Richard Johnson. It's about flying drones over people in vehicles. So I'm going to read out most of his question here. He says, the way I understand it is you can fly over people, just not over crowds or sustained flight over person persons and it's about the same for vehicles the reason i ask this is because i want to do an oblique capture of a church and the flight path will require that i fly over two sidewalks and a four-lane road can i do this without a waiver with a dji mavic 3e and no prop guards today i have with me david young here to help me answer this question david thanks for being back here today what's up john good to be back as always i think this is the most dressed up i've ever been for this podcast. And it's not because of you, although I would dress up for you. I'm at a conference right now in San Diego and I arrived at this conference realizing I was severely underdressed. So I literally had to go out and uh, purchase a suit coat. So I'm, I'm wearing that today to look very official so that people can trust my answer on this question. So it's a great question, comes up a lot. I hear it quite often and there's some confusion around it because the original rules were different. So when the original drone rules were published by the FAA back in 2016, the original rules were like, you cannot fly over people. You cannot fly over cars. There were a few exceptions, but generally you couldn't fly over them at all. I think one exception was like, if someone's like under an awning or something like that, or the car is stationary and someone's in, it was weird, weird rules, but in general, you couldn't do it. Then in 2020, they, they did a notice of proposed rulemaking to change some of the rules. This is when some of the remote ID stuff was starting to come out. But in 2021, a lot of new laws took effect. Uh, or new regulations. Those regulations had to do with things like flying at night, uh, but it also included flying over people, flying over vehicles, and some of the remote ID stuff. So we'll just focus in on the changes that were made for flying over people and flying over cars. And, it's, and it was better. They opened it up, but also added some confusion around all these different categories. So I'll try to keep it simple for you here. Let's tackle this question about vehicles first. So we'll post some links in the description of this video, if you're on YouTube or whatever, this is going to the FAA's website. They have a nice little write-up on it, but um, I'm going to pull sources directly from the Department of Seven Regulations and some from the FAA's website. So we're going to, on this link uh, on the FAA's uh, website, you can find it, Operation of Vehicles. Basically, either this small unmanned aircraft, you have to be in a closed site environment or restricted access site. So think of something like a movie set, right? Or Navy base that no one's going to get off. But I think it's primarily referring to closed accesses in like movie sets, maybe concerts, but generally those are going to be over people, which is a different, a different thing. So it either has to be a closed access site or the small in, unmanned aircraft does not maintain sustained flight over moving vehicles. So you can't hover above a car or you can't uh, like fly directly down the interstate, like, you know, paralleling directly over the interstate. But if you're just flying over a road or you're crossing over the interstate or you're doing a mapping job, and the drone is sort of going in a zigzag pattern or whatever, and you happen to cross over a car, that is fine. I think the FAA realized that and, and loosened it up a little bit. Because his question was, I'm going to do an oblique capture of a church. So for those of you who don't know, in mapping oblique is like when the camera is not looking straight down, but it's at a bit of an angle. It helps with uh, getting more 3D dimensions for maps and models. Then so get an oblique capture of a church and the flight path will require that I fly over two sidewalks in a four lane road. There you go. So he's just gonna be crossing over the four lane road when he's doing his capture. So on the vehicle side of things, he's fine. With that said, we're gonna go over to human beings. So the part of the regulations that dictates operation over human beings, you wanna get nerdy and look it all up. It's part 107.39, operation over human beings. And in general, it says, no person may operate a small unmanned aircraft over human beings unless there are three things. A, the human being is directly participating in the operation of the small unmanned aircraft, AKA yourself, you can fly over yourself. The human being is located under a covered structure or inside a stationary vehicle that can provide reasonable protection. So that's like an awning, you're sitting inside of a car. That's, that was part of the old requirements. And then the third one is, is the more, is the newer one where it says the operation meets the requirements of at least one of the operational categories specified in subpart D of this part. And you're just like, okay, gosh. So now there's a subpart D. They created a whole new section called subpart D. And so what that covers, it talks about four different categories of operations and each category has some different rules and it gets a little bit complicated, but let's start with defining those categories real quick. And then you'll know which, which one uh, applies to you and, and what you can or can't do. Let's start with category one. So category one is defined in the regulations from the FAA 
as a drone that weighs less than 0.55 pounds, uh, basically with everything loaded up on it, that's the same weight cutoff limit as uh, the drone registration uh, limit. So if you have a really small drone that doesn't require uh, registration, if you're using it recreationally, that would now be in a category one. But in order to also be included in category one, it has to have prop guards, essentially. It says it doesn't contain any exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin. Now you could say, maybe my propellers aren't strong. If I have like a small drone, maybe those propellers aren't strong enough to lacerate human skin. Uh, but otherwise you would just need prop guards if you really want to be compliant with that. So it's category one. If you have that, you're flying around a little drone, it's got prop guards on it, or the propellers aren't going to lacerate human skin. You can fly it over people all day long, no big deal. But there's a caveat to that. And there's a caveat basically with all these operations. You cannot operate over what they call open air assemblies. So think about a concert with a bunch of people standing still or a protest or something where you got a huge group of people standing still and you're trying to hover the drone over them watching them. They don't want that because if the drone falls out of the sky, high likelihood it's going to actually hit someone. So you cannot operate over open air assemblies unless you uh, meet some other requirements. So let's talk about that in a second. So now let's get to category two. So a category two operation, this is a little bit dicier and more complicated. So the way they wrote it is that to be eligible for a category two operation, basically you're above a category one, so it's heavier than 0.55 pounds, but where's the cutoff between category two and category three? Well, it is where the drone will not cause uh, injury by a transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy upon impact from rigid object. Like what in the world does that mean? Basically it can't cause more than 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy, which is calculated by how heavy something is and how fast it is moving. So in order to get that calculation, you would look at how fast your drone might fall out of the sky, what speed it would get and how heavy it is. And if you're like, how in the world am I supposed to calculate that? Really the FAA has not put out a good like list of guidance. Like, Hey, these drones are category two. Hey, these drones are category three. I've even like looked for like, do the manufacturers list that there's really not a good set of information or like a list of like, oh, hey, here's a category two drones, here's category three. There are some calculators online because you could say, oh, my drone and all of its equipment is, you know, five pounds. And how high am I going to be flying my drone above the ground? Because the higher up it is, the faster it can, you know, more momentum it can get. So you can look at altitude mm -hmm. and weight. And there are some calculators that can sort of estimate your kinetic foot pounds of energy. Uh, so you know, let's just do an example here. Let's look at the Mavic 3 Enterprise, which is this guy's thing, right? Let's do a little calculation. So we're going to get a little bit mathy here. So I looked at the Mavic 3 Enterprise drone that he's using, and the weight is anywhere between 920 and 1,050 grams. So let's call it about a kilogram, 2.2 pounds. If you plug that into a calculation, you say, hey, it's got one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. And the velocity, so how fast it's moving, if you just do 10 miles an hour, so let's say you're flying and it falls out of the sky and you're at an altitude of where the drone won't reach more than 10 miles an hour, or you're flying pretty low and you're flying forward, not faster than 10 miles an hour. How much foot pounds energy would that give you? So that's uh, kinetic energy that's give you almost exactly 10 joules of energy. And if you translate that into what the FAA uses, which is foot pounds, that is 7.3 foot pounds of kinetic energy. So at that rate, you would be in a category two operation. It wouldn't become a category three operation until you got over about 15 joules. 12.5 miles an hour is about the cutoff. So Mavic 3 Enterprise, if you keep it under 12 and a half miles an hour, you can categorize that as a category two operation. And as long as you're not an altitude high enough where when it starts falling, it will go faster than 12.5 miles per hour. Again, this is kind of like very letter of the law. You know what I'm saying? I think in reality, what you're going to get is if you're not flying over open air assemblies and you happen to pass over someone, the reality is it's probably not going to be a big deal. But what I would do if I was in this guy's situation, I would just say, while I'm doing the mission, I'd put a couple cones on the sidewalk or something and say, hey, for these five minutes, please don't walk by here. That way he doesn't have to worry about flying over people. You know, there's like little things you can do there. But just for the sake of argument, let's keep going with our category. So that's category two. Category three is essentially the same thing, except now you can go up to 25 foot pounds of kinetic energy. That is a category three operation. So another way you can make your drones more compliant is if you have some type of parachute system. So let's say they fall out of the sky. There are different systems that will shoot a parachute out and it'll slow the drone down. So it doesn't like just come crashing down into the ground. It'll just kind of come to rest. 
and that can get that velocity slower. So that way you can reduce your kinetic energy and qualify for a lower category of operation. So if you're flying in a category two or category three situation, you actually have to have a declaration of compliance from the FAA, which means that you have to submit all this stuff showing how you're compliant with operating manuals and you have to send in all your information, serial numbers of the drones, your means of compliance, like how you're going to comply with keeping the drone within those parameters. So one method was the parachutes. You got to declare that it doesn't have any safety defects, that it can be inspected. The FAA has to accept it, all this stuff, right? So it's a pretty long process to do this officially if you're going to be flying over people a lot of times. The same thing with category two and category three. So category three is heavier. So I would imagine that just you have to show, hey, here's how we're going to keep it safe. Now, if you go to a category four, that is category four craft is one where it has its own airworthiness certificate. So it's gone through all these other processes to be inspected by the FAA and to be declared airworthy that it can fly around safely. So those are the categories. There's a lot of them. And in, in each of the category two and three, they can't have any exposed rotating parts, again, like propellers and blades. So this guy wanted to be letter of the law, say he's fine on the cars, as long as he doesn't like fly over them and, and hover over the interstate. And then on the people, he would just need to either block off the sidewalks, ask people not to cross over during that time, or change his flight path to not include the sidewalks, maybe fly a little bit to either side, or make it a closed set environment where you literally are like saying, like, hey, no one's allowed to come in here, which is kind of like walking on the sidewalks. If I was looking at this, I'm not an attorney, but my experience as an FAA instructor is, this is what I would recommend for his operation. The easiest of which would be just change your flight path a little bit. You can still probably capture the same data, you know, to not fly directly over the sidewalks or throw some cones out and block them off for a few minutes. That makes sense. And it sounds like those easiest suggestions there for Richard. My, my question is, could he qualify under category one if he just put prop guards on? Yeah, but the Mavic 3 Enterprise, which is what he's flying, is like a two pound drone. And he needs one that's under half a pound to be category one. Gotcha. You know? So yes, technically, but that's really, really the only ones that are under half a pound were like the old Mavic, the, the mini series, like the mini two drones, but they were only under that threshold without the prop guards. And so you should put the prop guards on it just gets them over the weight threshold to where now they're above that. So, well, David, this is important information. There's plenty of people, especially within the Drone Launch Academy community who want to do jobs and it's going to require flying over people, flying over vehicles. So this is really good to know. And it looks like there's some homework required, but to your point, there are a couple of little things you can do to maybe get around some of these things and keep people safe at the same time. Yeah. One other thing I just should add to in the regulations, I didn't list it off because it wasn't necessarily pertinent to his operation, but if you're doing flight over open air assemblies, you're also required to be compliant with remote ID. So something else that was in the rules that I didn't mention because he wasn't flying over an open air assembly, but I didn't want anyone to be like, I oh, ID. So there it is. Remote ID is important. Good reminder there. Thank you. Well, David, thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Again, an important question that you've answered for us. And I hope Richard has gotten his answer. Hey, if you've got a drone question, we'd love to answer it for you. You can submit your drone question over ydqa.io. Or if you're a part of the Drone Launch Connect community like Richard, feel free to type your question in there. We'll see it and we will find the answer to it. In the meantime, we'll see you in the sky.